I'll be at the House of Comedy September 15th through the 17th. Tickets available at ryansickler.com. I got my passport and my knife hands ready. Let's go, y'all! Edmonton, September 29th through October 1st, and Chicago, I will see you all November 11th and 12th. Get tickets to all shows on my website at ryansickler.com. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I am Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all your social media. And as always, thank you for supporting this show. The community is continuing to grow and grow. I love you guys for it. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. It helps. It means nothing to you and everything to us, all right? Also, if you want more, the Patreon's out there. It's called the Honeydew with y'all. I'm highlighting the lowlights with y'all. And y'all got the craziest fucking stories I've ever heard in my life. All right. It's five bucks a month. If you sign up for a year, you get over a month free. You get the honeydew a day early. You get it ad free at no additional cost. All right. If you or somebody you know has a story that has to be heard, please submit it to honeydewpodcast at gmail.com. Hopefully we'll get to do an episode together. All right. That's the biz there. You guys know uh, the tour is still rolling on. I can't thank you enough for your support there. Vancouver, September 15th through the 17th. Edmonton, September 29th through October 1st. Chicago, November 11th and the 12th. All right, that's the business. You guys know what we do over here. We highlight the lowlights. I say all the time, these are the stories behind the storytellers. I am very excited to have this guest on. First time here on The Do, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Nick Doom. Welcome to the Honeydew, Nick Doom. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Nick. Yeah, that was a big intro. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I'm I, I'm excited. I like what I do. I love my guests. Mm-hmm. I like what their stories are. Uh, and you're no exception, young man. I said to you when you walked up, like, dude, just fucking hang this comedy shit up, model. Why don't? Why are you fucking around? Why? I mean, though? but you said something to me before that. You saw me do something quite miraculous. I would say. First of all, let's give you props. So back in the day, <laughs> am I allowed to talk about this, Nick? <laughs> you can tell me if I can't. Did a Honda commercial, okay? Oh, okay, yeah. Right. And Honda and he went back and forth on negotiations and Nick was like, "Eh," and was like, "What about a new car?" And they wanted him to take a Honda Fit and he's like, "I'm how old are you? 6 what? 4 6 4 6 4 5 16 in Canada. 5 16 in Canada." And uh, he was like, "Now nah, I'm going to need that Honda Ridgeline." And they gave him a Honda Ridgeline. I'm a big fan of the Honda Ridgeline. I've uh, driven one. My cousin has one. And this motherfucker, <laughs> uh, parallel parked beautifully. Like, I have had no idea anyone was watching. No it was idea. just honestly just for me. I'm just out there having a little smoke, watching them. It was on Santa Monica Boulevard. It wasn't like a simple no, neighborhood street where I could just take cars are coming. Pressure. And it was a one and done. One and done. And bro. then I look over and guess who watched the whole thing happen? It was not only a one and done. It was a one and done to where I landed with both tires on the curb and properly cocked because you will get a ticket out here for some assholes that don't yeah, like that the t- shit. The t- yeah, the thing was already perfect. like that. Yes. Yeah, left. Mm-hmm. Like boom, all you got to do is turn it off, put it in fucking park. You're good. I to didn't go. even have to change the steering to get out of that spot, yeah, that which was, I did get out because you let me know that there was a free spot. Yeah, don't pay this city seventy dollars. And I think not after you park like that. A lot of they people don't deserve your yeah. money after you. No, did I that. think a lot of people that have a bigger ego would say, "No, that parking job, I can't move it." But for me, it was like, "I'll throw that away." I don't care. If you would have took it. <laughs> <laughs> if you would have took 20 minutes to get in out of it like just stay just fucking stay <laughs> just stay it's gonna be an hour before you get out uh all right before we begin uh please plug promote everything um well i i, I was trying to figure out my dates but all i got right now is october 8th chicago at the den theater which is going to be just a brilliant show I had a, I've got like some European stuff I think coming up that I haven't nailed down yet, but how's your European audience? I mean, London's really supportive. Yeah. Um, I would say London's very supportive. I don't know about <laughs> how much any more Europe over there. <laughs> Australia's super supportive. Yeah. Not Europe, but still yeah. outside of the US. You'd be surprised about Europe, you know, because there's Americans there that are using like local like DNS codes on their like computers to get, oh, to gain things. And I so- see. You're probably getting pinged that someone in Arizona is watching it, but really it's 
some hot chick in Paris. Ooh, wee oui, wee. Oui. <laughs> um, all right, you're here to actually real quick. Just where can they get all your dates? Whenever they're coming to see you, what's your website? Where do you they know go? my website's been having troubles. <laughs> It's going to be the theme of this episode. I was, I, my my self promotion is. I mean, I, I I post everything on Instagram, so that's kind of it. I have like a daily relationship with my Instagram followers. Okay, um, and I'll let people know about dates on there. Usually, I, I put it all together in a tour, post the tour, put like a little flyer, poster, or whatever. I put a lot of care into that stuff. But Good. you think if I did that, I would have my website dialed in. Well, you did something that just sparked my memory right now a while back where um i thought was really interesting didn't you uh promote on a billboard didn't you buy a billboard and promote that's what a lot of people think that's what they think what was it what what? i (laughs) hired a graphic designer and this was i think i think there was instagram but it wasn't it was mostly twitter yeah it was early and i got like i i made this whole story up where i got you know comedy central gave me a thousand dollars to promote my special and I decided to do it on, or Netflix. Netflix gave me a thousand bucks. And I decided to do like the one billboard I could afford, which is on like a freeway in central Oregon somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And <laughs> just like posted it. But you know, it's good when like comedians are like, man, that's cool. It's like, oh, you couldn't tell that that was obviously fake, you know? But no, like, that was a, I that created was kind well of a whole done. story around it. And then some people were like, I wish I would have just kept thinking it was real because it seems kind of like you're a liar now. And so I had to deal with that fallout. Yeah. With friends. Fall out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fall out. Um, all right. I know we're going to talk about rehab today. And I know you, you, everyone sends their topics in before you, you say rehab at 17. That's really early to go to rehab. So let's talk about what leads us there. You're originally from Seattle, I know. Yeah. Um, and what's your it, upbringing like? It very, you know, I would say like the lowest of middle class in a neighborhood where people are more upper middle Mm -hmm. class, you know, but they're, I think it was also people that weren't too flashy with their money, you know, in this neighborhood. But like all my friends were walking around in Jordans and and stuff, you know, even though their houses weren't like insane. But like back then that was a big deal to have Jordans. I never, I never had a pair. No. I wanted a pair so bad. And my mom showed up with a pair of the Shaquille O'Neal's that she got on sale. (laughs) At like Nordstrom or something. I remember those. Just like black. I'm ripping the bill my m- backboard down. Black and purple <laughs> suede. <laughs> suede. Like, oh, no. I mean, and I was the kid that like I grew, I became 6'4 when I was like 15. Damn, did you really? But I okay. had the feet of somebody that was 6'4 when I was like 11. So, so you grew in your feet. Yeah, those Shaquille O'Neal. It's like a puppy. You know, when you see a puppy yeah. with big feet, you're like, oh, they're going to turn out all right. But uh, yeah, so I had these like huge moon boots on. But I think that was also kind of the, what led me down this path was everything I got wasn't as good as my friends. And everyone around was pretty materialistic in the sense of a starter jacket. You know, all the things that like mattered at that age. I know, the dumbest shit. Like you, I'm, you're speaking to me because I never had a real pair of Vans. They were always a knockoff checker pair, but they yeah. weren't Vans. Mm-hmm. We never had jams. They were a big pair of uh, like shorts, board shorts. Yeah. yeah. So my mom would sew shit, like make her yeah. own from Joanne Fabrics. We're like, Jesus Christ, they're ripping and shit. Like, come on, man. Everybody knows these ain't jams. <laughs> come on. I'm on that. Okay, Everyone ham, thinks these though, are jellies. Right? Mams. <laughs> uh, it was always secondhand or a knockoff or, you know, just, and back then stores, well, shit, it was Kmart and they had stuff called McGregor. You know what yeah. I mean? Now Target's got fucking Tony Hawk and, yeah, and, people and re- are. quality shit that you're not going to get bullied for and get your ass kicked because you don't have the cool stuff anymore. I mean, and, and you know, one, th- one story that I always remember is my dad took me out to get a baseball glove. And he took me, it was called Olympic sports. I don't even know if those still exist up in the Northwest, but, and I came home and it was probably a $40 baseball glove. And it was the same one my friends had. And I was so excited. And I think I was home for five minutes before my mom put me in her car, drove me back, returned it, Nuh-uh. and then got the cheapest one they had and then brought me back home. Oh, that's brutal. And it was just, you know, like it was, it was like, I know my dad. <laughs> just he, to taste that glory for me. I know. <laughs> Like my dad wanted me to have yeah. what I wanted, you know, like, cause he wanted me to feel like I wasn't like at a different class than the other people. But then my mom was like realistic and like, no, we're about to go bankrupt. So he's going to get, you know, every dollar counts around here. But that, 
you know, I found I was embarrassed about that kind of stuff. Me too. Really. Yeah. And were you a free lunch kid? No. Well, make make my mom made my no, lunch every I mean, day. Yeah. No. Oh, I didn't got, get the free lunches. Oh, no. Had, yeah. I don't think they even had those where I where I you know I was like in a suburb of Seattle. It was really it was where Microsoft is, and it, Microsoft was <laughs> yeah. just Microsoft was just starting then. Okay. So that not was not Microsoft like now. Today. Yeah. No, it was the beginnings, it, but it was turning. You could see it turning. Um, but you know, they were all, all of them were slightly better at sports than me, you know, like actually not slightly better. I was a good athlete comparative to regular people, but they were the elite. Like they all played college something or other. They were all on the all-star teams. They all played varsity when they were freshmen. Like they all were the guys. And here I was like the one that was like part of the group that wasn't quite, you know. And so when junior high hit, I started to realize there was other ways to get attention, you know, besides being a good athlete, it was just being sociable, you know, and, and, and being kind of a daredevil in the sense of like jumping off bridges into rivers. And like, you know, I, I just decided at one point, like, despite my fear, I'm going to be the first to, to do everything when it comes to risky behavior. Jump Like there was a bridge that everyone jumped off of and all my friends were like, oh, and we get up there and they'd all stand there. And I would just like, I just made a decision. You're jumping in the first 10 seconds. When he, people aren't even waiting, people don't even know you're going to jump, you're going to jump because the what the reputation that that's going to give you will suffice and fill you for the one that you're lacking with the, the athletes. Of, How know? high up's the bridge? This bridge was, it's funny because you could jump off the bottom of it or you could climb up to a really dangerous like type that's, thing. You're saying it's, it's yeah. like my summers. We had the metal rafters that were under. The top was 100 feet yeah. uh, from the street. And then there was a good chunk, maybe 50 feet, 60 feet from yeah. these metal rafters that went down. Well, and this one wasn't even that big because we were pretty young still. I would say it was like 30 feet, you know, and then where I was jumping off was like 40. But I wasn't doing flips or anything. I would just be the first guy. I could never do a flip. Like I, <laughs> I look back and it's like, why was my dad not having me in backflip training <laughs> from the age of two? Backflip training. <laughs> you know what That's I mean? Every kid should be in backflip training because that is something you'll take with you your whole, you know, like. <laughs> till your 40s. In your high. <laughs> I, yeah, uh, you know, so now these days with yeah. knees and repair, you know, guys are doing it into their Good 50s. Point. Good point. Uh, <laughs> Good point. <laughs> this younger generation of backflippers are, really, are probably yeah. really helpful for that. Yeah. But, you know, in high school, like the one guy that could do a backflip was a fucking king. Yeah, he was. It was like every assembly. It's like, all right, we're about to start the assembly. Does backflip guy want to do one real yeah. fast out yeah. here on yeah, the floor? Get everyone psyched up. up. Yeah. <laughs> Where's our backflipper? <laughs> His name's Daniel or something. <laughs> Yeah, in there, man. He's out there flipping for his friends. Oh, man, he's wearing a tank top again. Here he goes. <laughs> Everyone in first period knows he yeah. was wearing a sweatshirt. You were a king if you could backflip. The, uh, you know, I always wish I was the backflip guy. Always. Yeah, he was popular for sure. Yeah, I, so I, but getting into high school, I then, you know, I was like the first guy. I had the early birthday. So I turned 16 before most of my friends. So I got my driver's license first. So I was that guy all, already like driving around, going to parties. What are you driving? I was driving an 88 Jetta GL. Okay. And it was, I loved that car. And now I look back and like, that was a cool car. Like despite, like a lot of my friends got like a Nissan Pulsar. Like they got these, Pulsar, you know. Pulsar, yeah, the Pulsar NX. My yeah. friend had a Toyota truck. I thought that was cool. But the Jetta was a stylish car in the 80s. It had a good form. It was cut really well. You know, and then I, I actually was graduated was to it. Diesel? No, this was a My brother. It, had it was a manual. It lasted forever. Yeah, manual. Only friend that had a manual, by the way, which was another like chalk up for me. Like anyone time, anytime somebody got my car, they're like, "Whoa, you're an adult. You know, you know how to do. <laughs> you know how to do. You this? know how to do adult yeah, stuff." Yeah. But I remember, dude, the the best memory was I had a friend's dad who had a manual that would drive us to school sometimes, and I remember the feeling of it. I just couldn't. I loved it. I would sit in the back seat and feel go all the way up and come back and hit around corners, and it was like a Thunderbird he had. Um, more of a sedan type Thunderbird. But I, when I got my car, we got it like an hour out of Seattle. I went with my brothers and my dad. My dad had a Honda Accord man, or automatic. We get the Jetta. My dad gets in. I don't know. I've never driven a stick. I've never gotten into a stick. Oh, ship. really? You hadn't even known? How? All right. I've been in them and I knew how, I knew the feel of it. Mm -hmm. I knew the timing. I, I kind of knew all of it. But he drives us 45 minutes and gets off the freeway. And I'm driving my brothers now in his car and he pulls into a 7-Eleven. And the 7-Eleven has a full hill drop into the parking lot, right? So we pull in, he gets out, throws me the keys and says, all right, see you at home. Gets in with my brothers and just takes off. So now I'm sitting there like, no idea 
about any ah, of it. Ah, that's a hell of a good lesson. And I, I asked, I like, that. I went in and I was like, hey, when you drive a stick shift, like the guy at 7 Eleven, I was like, you dropped the clutch. And then, you know, like I was trying to figure that out and I get in and I'm like, so I back it around. I get that, you know, but in the Jetta also, it was a push down, push, in, push up. Yeah. And then I got it to where I could get up the hill, but I couldn't start it. I couldn't get it going once I was on the hill. So then I would basically get up to the top of the hill and watch and wait for the biggest window possible, reverse down, and just I gunned it out. No stopping, <laughs> no stopping at the top of the hill. Oh, no stopping at the top of the hill, nothing. And I remember pulling up, my dad was like in the in the well, dining like the dining room window, just like, yep. He made it. Like that's back when, like, you know, like in, in like the medieval days, they like let their son kill a wolf or something. You know, that that's basically the the I think equivalent to that. <laughs> so I, you know, and then I just started partying and it wasn't crazy, but it was out of control. And it started to ruin my life immediately in the sense of like behavioral issues. I never respected authority. I never had good grades and it just got worse, you know, and I got caught drinking at now, school. Let me ask you, were you, was it that you, your grades are one thing, but were you just, was it not um, in, entertaining enough for you? School, was it not no. challenging enough for you? I, that no, kid that just, was like, this is so easy. I, my mind is out the window and looking at like, God, what would it be like to be like, the lead singer of you too you know like i'm thinking <laughs> yeah, of, yeah okay. like i'm thinking that shit right, and, yeah. and they're like all right so time to turn in your your quiz it's like oh there it is you know like d's i was getting d's and i was maybe getting a c and if i had a b which it happened a couple times it was like the biggest celebration okay. my parents you know but also it's like hey it's just a b we're not going to give you too much here but we, we listen we hired the proud. back flipper daddy come on <laughs> daddy, out here gotta... get in the kitchen daddy <laughs> No, flip, with it. Flip for Nick. He got to be. Good. He's got a tank top on. Come on in, bud. <laughs> he means business. He means business. <laughs> Do you ever feel overwhelmed by the number of plastic bottles and containers that you throw away? Ever thought about purchasing more eco-friendly products but didn't know where to start? Well, if you answered yes to either of those questions, meet Blue Land. Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastics by reinventing Home essentials that are good for you and the planet. Blue Land's innovative tablet refill solution takes up 10 times less space than a traditional bottle, and their powerful formulas keep your home clean and smelling amazing. The idea is simple. You grab one of the beautiful Forever bottles, you fill it with warm water, you drop in the tablet, boom, you get cleaning. Refills start at $2, and you don't have to buy a new plastic bottle every time you run out. You can even set up a subscription so you never run out of the products you use the most. From cleaning sprays to hand soap to toilet cleaner and laundry tablets, all Blue Land products are made with ingredients you can feel good about. Try their Clean Essentials Kit, which has everything you need to get started. Products come in refreshing signature scents like iris agave, fresh lemon, and eucalyptus mint. And for a limited time, their hand soap is getting a summer upgrade with three refreshing new scents. Strawberry rhubarb, citrus patchouli, and coconut palm. Right now, you can get 15% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash honeydew. That's 15% off your first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com slash honeydew. Blueland.com slash honeydew. You just need to take better care of yourself is not a response to mental health struggles. You know, you live with it. So sometimes you need something more to achieve a real and lasting breakthrough. And maybe it's time you check out a guided ketamine therapy program from MindBloom. MindBloom is the leader in at-home ketamine therapy, offering a combination of science-backed medicine with clinician and guide support for people looking to improve their mental health and well-being. MindBloom connects patients to licensed psychiatric clinicians to help them achieve better outcomes with lower costs, greater convenience, and an artfully crafted experience. To begin, take MindBloom's online assessment to determine if MindBloom is right for you. If approved, you'll schedule a video consult with a licensed clinician where you'll discuss your goals and expectations for mental health treatment. MindBloom will send you a kit in the mail complete with medicine, treatment materials, and tips for getting the most out of your experience. After only two sessions, 87% of MindBloom clients reported improvements in depression and 85% reported improvements in anxiety. It's time to enter the next chapter in mental health and well-being. Let MindBloom guide you right now. 
MindBloom is offering my listeners $100 off your first six-session program when you sign up at mindbloom.com slash honeydew, and you use the promo code honeydew at checkout. Go to mindbloom.com slash honeydew, promo code honeydew. You're going to get $100 off your first six-session program today. That's mindbloom.com slash honeydew, promo code honeydew. My good buddy Gary Adler's got a brand new comic book out. Gary's literally had his fingerprints all over the studio and everything. It's called Commando Place Number 2. All right, the first one was kick-ass. It's called Speedrunner's Paradise. If you are a comic book fan, I'm telling you, this is the way to go. It's a great read. Um, he's got the third one coming out this fall. So I wanted to give a little love and a shout-out to Gary Adler and Commando Place. Go find it. Now, let's get back to the dude. And, uh, and so, I, what is your? What are you doing? Are you drinking? Are you smoking? Drinking like, and what's smoking your, pot. And I okay. remember I got I had a fake ID. I was the only guy that got it. I at drove, fucking how old? At this point, I was sixteen. 16? Damn. So I had driven downtown Seattle into the U district and got this Oregon State ID. It wasn't a driver's license, you know, just a laminated red card that. And my name was Glenn Michaels, is what I came <laughs> up with because I love the skier named Glenn Plake. That's how we're going to ID you for this episode. Glenn Michaels. A.K.A. Glenn Michaels. Yeah, actually, yesterday would have been my fake ID birthday. <laughs> Is that real? I would have been, I would have been 47. 47? <laughs> yeah. All right, Glenn. <laughs> I, um, I, so oh, I, I, I'm Glenn Michaels, and we go to a party, right? And now it's like around. Like, I had gotten booze that night. I went to this. I went to one place that was like the place that I knew didn't give a shit. So they give me booze. I take it to the party. Party's going. Booze is running out. There is There was a keg there. That's running out. And uh, some of the guys are like, hey, Nick has a fake ID. And so then this guy named Chris Gregory, who was the stud. I mean, he was the guy. He was a year ahead of us, but he looked like an NFL player, and he was on our football team. I mean, he was like the, you know, like Cam Chancellor, the way that this guy would take yeah, people yeah. out. He was just a, a headhunter. You know, and it was, he was a stud and he had a Jeep, a Wrangler. And he goes, I'll take you down to get it. And I was like nervous, you know, so Chris Gregory's going to take me down. I'm not going to turn that down. So I hop in the Jeep. We get down, we get in. He goes, I go in the store. I got a whole fucking laundry list of shit to get, you know? <laughs> yeah, paper in there. Yeah. <laughs> and I go in and I'm like getting all the stuff and I go up to the counter and I'm like, ugh, and I put it down. And uh, she goes, uh, Hey, I remember you from earlier, but let me get another look at that ID. And I was like, oh, okay. And I show it to her and she goes, yeah, this, this isn't going to work. And she kept it. No. Nah. And I go, okay, well, I'll go put all this back. And I just grabbed it and ran out the door. Fuck like yeah. there's no, <laughs> no chance I'm getting into Chris Gregory's no car without this booze. Or your or ID. Or getting back to the That's party. That's right. You got one or the other. Yeah. And that and goddamn so beer is coming. I remember a, like a, a 12 pack. I got a 12 pack of Bud Light for some reason. I had like a Miller natural ice, like whatever. Like it was like four boxes. The Bud Lights just spill out throughout. Like because it's a gas station also. Just spill out. And they're like fucking f foaming. Jump in the car. Go. Go. <laughs> go. <laughs> Now you got he starts fucking driving. Now he's a getaway driver. He pulls around the corner, and as we're driving down, like one of the four, <laughs> like the four main streets in Redmond, Washington, right? And it was like Redmond Way. We're driving down, coming the other direction. Cop car, beep, beep, that fast, just goes right by us. Yeah, oh. it was a small, you know, like it just happened that fast around there, and um, we just kept driving up to the party, legend status immediately. Fuck you know, yeah, like, dude! And once you get like up to that place. Right. Now rumors are being told about you. My brothers were hearing about me. They're five years younger. They're hearing about me at school now. They're hearing about their older brother and like the, the stuff that he's done. And um, are you drinking nightly? Or are you drinking at home? I was. I was beginning to drink nightly, nightly. like sneaking out, drinking my parents' stuff, having hidden stuff, their stuff too. Yeah, smoking pot. Uh, all my friends would like get caught and then blame me. I was like the fall guy for everything. Always took it. Always took it. Always got grounded. Always like persevered. <laughs> got through, got back out, didn't let it hold me back. <laughs> I, I mean, but I was a, I was a maniac, and, and like my brothers were um, in basketball at, at their junior high, which was just around the corner, Redmond Junior High. I was at Redmond High School, and one of the guys in in my um, brother's like basketball team called my brother a faggot, 
And my brother was just crushed. He was crying, you know, he thought like everyone thought he was, you know, like in that time that was like, so, you know, this is 96. Mm -hmm. So that's like a pretty harsh thing to call somebody and then like a rumor to go around. So the next day I drove my jet up and I pulled into the bus lane right outside the gym, Redmond Junior High, left the car running. High school kid. Yeah, walked into the gym, basketball practice is happening. All the bleachers are up against the wall. You yeah, know, like yeah, they're, they're up, like retracted yeah, up against ball, the wall. Yeah. And I, I and I walk up and I, Jacob sees me, my brother, and he's just like, oh God, what? And, he, and I go, where is he? Which one? Which one? And he points at the guy and I walked up and he was close and I grabbed him and lifted him up against the bleachers. And I said, if you call my brother a faggot one more time, I'm going to suck your fucking dick. <laughs> And I walked out, got in my car and drove off. That guy, first of all, did not mess with my brother again. Second of all, sure. second of all, my brother gets becomes a police officer and gets me, and he's not anymore, but he was for a while and he he quit. But he he hired he got them to hire me to come play their holiday party to do stand up at it. And right before I'm about to, he goes, Hey, by the way, that guy that you uh he's actually one of my coworkers now. And we're cool. We laugh about it. You know? oh, but just cop. so you know, he's here now, too. <laughs> and real quick, before you go out, Danny, <laughs> get your ass in here, bro. Let's do those backflips. Warm them up for Nick, all right? You should have a tank top on. We'll see you Danny's backflipping in the gym. God, right next to the guy at the bleachers. Just like, what just I'm happened? I'm talking about the police event. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anywhere Danny could pop out, and it's going to be a great scenario. Oh, shit, dude. Yeah, so. That's fucking great. And at that point, I wasn't too far away from rehab I, and getting kicked out of school. I got suspended. I got in a fight in a church parking lot around the corner from our school, St. Jude's. That's where all the kind of bad shit went down after school. Some guy, uh, whatever the story is, it was just dumb. We just were circling each other in this parking lot, you know, and everyone's there. People from other schools had heard about it, that happening that day. They're there. He's a year older than me, but he's shorter than me, and but he's pretty like kind of I don't know how to explain him, but he's like a little gangster, you know, and uh, he we're circling. And finally, he goes, I thank God I'm not your dad because everybody knew I was like fucked up. Everybody knew that I was going through some shit and like I was the bad boy, like not like the bad boy, like tough boy, but like bad boy, like, oh, yeah, he doesn't care about any his life or anybody like he just is like going out. And is that how you felt, though? I was so insecure and just wanted everyone to like me. Okay. And I didn't see, it's when you're that close to it, it's hard to see what's actually happening and what your perception is. You know, my brothers told me years later about like, yeah, you were a legend. Like at our school during that time, you were like, people wouldn't look at us like the wrong way. You know, like it was. They were going to get their dicks sucked if they did. <laughs> they were. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to get their dicks sucked. <laughs> and so, so, you know, basically I, this guy, so he, he says, I'm glad I'm not your dad. Like, or thank God I'm not your mom or something like, because everyone knows that I'm kicked out of my house. I was actually living oh, you at got a, kicked somebody out. else's house right now. Oh, wow. What, wait, hold on before. All right, go ahead. Then I want to go back to why you get kicked out. Well, I just out got kicked it. out because of my, what I was up to. Like, okay. I just, it was like the last straw, you know, you're out of the house. And I, I went and lived with this dude, this dude from my school whose dad owned a Taekwondo studio. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the rule is I had to be in school and be taking Taekwondo. I couldn't be suspended again. I couldn't, I could live with them. So I'd taken about a month of Taekwondo. And really all that first month was about like just learning the right way to do this and to do like things like that against mm -hmm. a, against like a, you know, punching for a minute, like getting your endurance up, getting all your, like all these things. And I didn't realize I knew how to punch. I, like, I didn't realize. It's like one of those things, like, when Danny LaRusso was, like, like doing the fence, he yeah. didn't realize that he was going to be blocking shit with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. know, like, like, oh, my God. Like, this oh, is, my God. You know, I was going to apply to real life. <laughs> and But still, I wasn't, like, a fighter in my head, you mm -hmm. know? And so he says that, and I go at him, and I miss, I miss. And finally, he hockey punches me, man. He hockey knees me. He, he somehow gets my shirt over my head and knees me in the face. Like, I don't know if he meant to do it. I don't know if it was by accident. I mean, I don't know. It was a baller move on his end. And it what I didn't realize in the moment was that my braces, my lip, my lip oh, got stuck in my braces and had chipped a tooth. And um, I was gonna I was starting to bleed out of my mouth. I didn't know that. Now I'm just shirtless, flailing in a parking lot. And I just was literally like he's going like this, and I just threw one punch. And I'm not a fighter. I'm not like, I'm not a badass. I'm not anything. I just threw one punch and it hit the spot, knocked him out. 
like to the floor. Caused for a whole month, the white of his eye at school was red. No way. You know, one of those black eyes? Yeah. And, and I got him in the temple. There was just a stream of blood. And he's on the ground. Everyone's like, finish him, you know, whatever. Finish him, yeah. <laughs> yeah like, and, <laughs> like and that's combat. what I'm realizing. Yeah. I'm realizing right then my lip. And I was like, hold on, time out, time out. You know, this guy's on the ground. Yeah, it's over. I'm saying time out, though. And then all of a sudden, beep, cops are coming in. Everyone takes off. The next day at school, I walk in and the security guard at school sees me walking in. And he goes, what's up, time out? <laughs> I got and, back to him, yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, he was involved with the police because we were students. Like everybody at school, I mean, it was like time out. So it was like, even though I did what I did, I still called time out. And that somehow, it was like the story You're of my life. Like I wasn't, calling time yeah, out. yeah. <laughs> whatever. Um, and then, you know, three days later, my parents, I, I get arrested again. Um Again, for, like, trespassing. What was the first time? D, D, like, not DUIs, but what is it called? Like, DWIs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eyes. Um, you had an S on the end of that? You got more than one? No, 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 not DWI. Uh, minor in consumption, MIC. Oh, minor. Minor in okay, consumption, so you got minor in possession. Under age. Yeah, minor in consumption of alcohol, minor in possession of marijuana, um, trespassing. I, like, drunkenly, like, drove and on each, my. These are each different times of being arrested? Yeah. You drunkly drove on what? What were you about to say? I drunk. I my butt. We were camping, and I saw my buddy put his Forerunner keys in his uh, shoes. This is by that bridge we would jump off, McDonald River or McDonald Bridge or something over in like Duval. And uh, I pulled his keys out and hopped in his car and started taking it for a ride around this field, like just alone, just oh alone, <laughs> like you know, just yeah. tearing up somebody's yard. And um, that I got a DUI and I got. Um, you know, whatever. And that caused me to be kicked out of my friend's house. My dad had to come pick me up at the police station. How's and, that? Well, the interesting part of it is that it was May 17th, which is his birthday. Oh, no. Nah. And I've been not living at the house for a while. You know, like, so he picks me up. I wake up. There's two Advil next to my bed. There's a water. My dad, you know, he's like so like, he loves me so much and doesn't know what to do. But my mom is the really the stickler of like, this is not allowed in our house. He cannot be here. He's tearing our family apart. Because that's what happens when there's one person in a family that is living like that. All of the attention goes to that person. Yeah. And no one else is being paid attention to enough. And no one's like, they're all just so worried about this, this guy. And I remember my sister went to school with me. She was a year, year younger. And she walked up to me in the hallways. I would never even talk to her. I mean, I walked by her like she was my neighbors that I hated or something. Like she like, and she would hand me a, she handed me a note. She's like, Andrew and Jacob wanted you, my twin brothers that are younger. And I got it. I looked at the note and it's like, please come home. Please, we love you. Like we miss you. Like heart wrenching shit. I remember going in the bathroom and crying. And, and, um, so you were closer with them than you are with your sister? I wasn't really close to any of them. I was in they my own world. They just really missed you. And I was abusive at home. I was like, you know, mentally, like, you know, I never hurt anybody at home, but I was a fucking, I was yelling, screaming, breaking stuff in the house, punching holes in walls. You know, they were scared of me. And my brothers weren't getting loved by me. They were getting like, like, hey, we want a piece of gum. Like, and I had like bubble gum, like bubble gum flavor, cotton candy flavored. I remember this cotton candy flavored bubble gum. And uh, I was like, all right. Stick your head in the toilet, then you can have it. <laughs> no, nah, you. And I literally that. watched my brother dip his head in the <laughs> toilet, and I'm like, "All right, here's a piece." God damn. Just a dick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, now we love each other so much, and we're so close, and that all of this kind of brought that out. But yeah, so I woke up, and my dad said, "Hey, your mom won't let you live in the house anymore, still, um, and you can't go back to your friend's house." So I'm going down to Oregon, which was common for him for a week to do like a comp work conference in Eugene. And he said, I'll drop you off at your grandma's house. You can stay with her and then I'll pick you back up and we'll figure out what to do after that. So we get down to my grandma's house. We spend the night. He says, um, before, before I go down to Eugene, let's go fishing in the morning. Also common, go fishing all the time. So great, wake up at like four in the morning to go fly fishing with my dad, I think on the Deschutes River or something is what I've told. Which Sounds is amazing. Thing that we've done a lot. And so get in the car with a pillow, remember, like sleeping in the car on the way there. And just waking up in a parking lot to some building in Gresham, Oregon. And because uh, in Oregon, they have lockdown facilities. In Washington, they didn't. Okay. So in Oregon, you were in and there was no no escaping. It was like jail, you know? 
And the only people that could let you out was a doctor or your parents on their like, whether we're giving up on him, we don't care, we'll get him out, we're not paying anymore, or he's healed, we're letting him come home, sort of a thing. And I look out and there's people like white suits on and white gloves and rubber gloves, you know, my dad's just kind of, he's crying in the, in the uh, driver's seat. Yeah. And he just says, I'm sorry. And he gets out of the car and I'm just sitting there and the door opens. They're like, Is, are you gonna make this easy or, you know, and I just got out and they took me in. I was naked within like, I think three minutes bending over and they were um, licking my asshole. <laughs> 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 and then, what kind of facility is this? <laughs> it was like, Dad, surprise! <laughs> <laughs> no, they were, you know, like looking for a knife. Like if I had a knife jammed up my ass that I was mm -hmm. trying to, you know, get in there or something and and uh, drugs and whatever. You, this is what, like 5 a.m. now at this yeah, point? Yeah, 6 a.m. What however a long way it goes to start from, like, the day. From dude. Portland to Gresham, whatever yeah. that drive is. <laughs> and uh, immediately got put into this room and... And then immediately had to go into like a class, you know, like, I'm just like, this is a whirlwind thing, right? You know, I tell me to walk me through this. Like you go into this class, how many people are in there? Like, are they 15 or 20 male, female, a mix, uh, age ranges or what? All, all You're under, probably all under of, 18. Oh, okay. This is an under. Okay. Yeah. Most of them are around my age. All right. And, uh, most of them were in there for- Are there any Gs in there like nine years old and shit? You know, no, like no. <laughs> that's a different facility for them. <laughs> that's a different facility. <laughs> that's just daycare, I think. <laughs> but I remember walking into the the um, first little thing and everyone's at desks, like those school desks, you know, that okay. are like, that have like the thing and the mm -hmm. chairs attached. And then um, I'm sitting there and one of the girls says like that I'm cute. Turns out she's got a treatment relationship going on with some other guy in there. And so the second they break to go into small groups, that guy gets up and starts charging at me from across the room. And I see it coming and I'm just like, uh, and I just grab the desk and chair <laughs> and throw it. Yeah, good, you know, it doesn't yeah. hit him. It doesn't do anything. It just causes a huge disturbance and makes me look like I'm a psycho. So I get immediately put into the padded QR room, quiet room that they called it, where you're just strapped down you're strapped at the beginning of it they came in unstrapped me and uh, you know like after they thought i'd calm down even though i was like not ever not calm i was like nobody saw what happened you know and they've got a camera in there and the lady at the front desk is watching you and you know they let you out after a certain amount of time and how long did you spend in there i don't know it wasn't it was probably like a half hour it wasn't it wasn't like crazy but it it was this was two hours into waking up in a parking lot. I mean, assholes been spread open. People are charging you. You're in a padded quiet. I mean, dude, what I remember one thing that happened. 120 minutes, dude. God damn. <laughs> one thing that happened that was amazing is I was wearing my fishing pants, which my fishing pants had regular pockets here, but then also inside that pocket, there was a zipper with a deeper pocket inside. So you had two front pockets on either side. And in one of my front pockets, the inside one, I had a tin of uh, Copenhagen. And I loved, I was a chewer and smoker and everything, you know, and they didn't see that. In, they didn't check that inside pocket. And those are the pants. The only pair of pants they gave me in my only t-shirt was another thing. And um, I then had chew and I was using, I was bartering chew. Like a guy gave me his contact case. I filled up his contact case with chew, brought it to the next thing. And he gave me Adderall. I'd never even done Adderall. I'd never done any drugs besides weed. And, and but now I'm in rehab where I'm learning about, they're teaching me like, hey, drugs, new drugs. drugs are actually pretty cool. You know, like you hear the way you're hearing about them. You're like, oh, wow, I want to try that drug, you know? And I remember I had like a, a fire like thing in my room and I'd taken a, uh, a piece of paper wrapped the, the um, Adderall in it and put it in there. And then I put deodorant on my hand to reach in and stick it and pull it out. And I was like trying these Adderall. And 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 I started realizing like to get out, you gotta, you gotta change, you know? There's no other way to get out of this place or I gotta turn 18. And um, so I started faking it like immediately. And then I bought into it. And then I realized, oh yeah, I've got a problem. The way that I was acting is not normal. It's being in what, here. What, when was that moment? What hit you? I think that happened like two weeks in. And okay, it, so let me stop you there for one moment. The two weeks that you're spending in there at first, are you pissed at your parents? Like, what are your emotions about being in there? Oh, Scared, yes. angry, fear? Angry, what are you? So angry. You're what are people to at school are going to think? Them? I can't talk to anybody. No. I don't have any. Like, my parents came down for like a weekend. So in person like, is the only therapy way. Therapy session. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't talk to them. They would be like, hey, your your mom called, your grandma called. I'd be like, yeah, tell them to take a fucking hike. 
Um, and I felt like protected in a way, you know, like, hey, I'm in here. Also, what a story this is now. Like people are going to be like, wow, Nick did this. You know, like in, in my old mind thinking, I'm thinking like, oh, this is going to perpetuate this kind of thing, which it's not even a thing anymore. It's actually what I am. I'm actually this kind of bad kid. It's not like a cool allure anymore because we're all about to graduate and I'm just going to be a piece of shit and it's not going to be cool anymore, you know? But the thing that hit me that I've told so many people that have children that drink, that have, you know, people that in their lives that have a problem or if they have a problem, I realized that being in there wasn't normal. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a string of accidents that led to me getting stuck in a rehab. My friend Tom would never have been in there. My friend Raman never would have been in there. All my friends would never accidentally make it this far into rehab. It is, if it looks like a problem and it smells like a problem, it's a problem. problem. It's not, and that just that, that this is not normal. Like I say to people, going to an AA meeting, that's not normal, okay? Going, just assume, just like, let me try it out. That's not normal. People that don't have a problem don't think, let me try out an AA meeting. They don't, people that don't have a problem don't go to bed like, oh, I'm not going to do that again. They don't. They just don't. There's people that are normal and then there's people that aren't. And I was not normal. None of that was normal. And I got a whole fucking show full of these people. (laughs) Yeah, man. (laughs) I know. It's like, you know, and then when I got out, I changed. I don't understand that. Like, I've had a lot of uh, addicts sit across from me and tell me things like, they're blown away when I tell them I could finish half a beer, just have a beer and leave. And they're like, I can't. I can't. Yeah. Not only that, like if I, I have even one, been I'll have 20. And they're like, I'm not exaggerating. It just won't even, I can't stop. And I'm like, I, I understand what you're saying. So was it was it like that for you too? Were you? Yeah, I mean, beer, but you just said like drinking a beer. I wouldn't be holding a beer. That At that age, yes, beer. This is so... You know, what happened, though, was I then went to 12 years of pretty much being sober. Okay. So you got out at what point? Uh, I got two out. Two weeks? I got in, no, I got out at like six weeks. Six weeks. Okay. Because um, at two weeks in, you're like, fuck, this is not normal and I am going to commit to yeah, this. Yeah. And then I okay. loved it. I was like learning. You know, but there was like, we weren't even getting, getting let outside. We were in a lockdown facility, you know. Then they transferred me to another facility that had outdoors and stuff. And then I got sent home. Did you have any... Um, what did that girl call it? Relationship? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. I was heartbroken too. The reason I got into that fight with that guy was over a girl that had, had dumped me and broken my heart. And then apparently he was seen like with her at a party in a way that I didn't like the sound of. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I remember I had her I also in one of my pockets that they didn't take out was her picture. I had a picture, her school picture. <laughs> like that's all you had of people, you know? And I remember having it on my dresser, and then one day it fell behind my dresser. You can't move dressers in rehab; yeah. they're they're bolted down. Yeah, pictures because it's gone. possible it's still suicide. There. It's yeah, still there. it was gone. And I remember like saying like, "Hey, I need somebody to come get this picture out. I need somebody to." And they were like, "You know, like no." And then finally, I was just like, "I needed that picture to go back there. I needed to stop looking at that." You know, and like causing this like allure of heartbreak. It's not what that's not what's happening. That was a bullshit relationship. You're a kid. This is what's happening, you know? And I remember getting out and I had this moment where I like walked out because my parents had been sending me to church a lot, you know, my whole life um, because I was bad. And they were like, you know, they started going to church just to make it so I would go. You is know? that right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I was going into the youth group and I loved youth group because I was also my reputation, you know, like preceded me. Like they all knew about me and I was cool. I was like the bad kid, you know? And then I got sober and I remember walking out and none of my friends knew where I was that whole time. Nobody knew. My parents didn't tell anybody where I had been. I was just disappeared. And I walk out and this guy, Kurt, pulls up, who was the sound guy at the high school church group. He had a, he had a Jetta GLI. Those are nice. Those yeah, are nice. Yeah. Red. It was beautiful. It had turbo and it had everything. He, he pulls up. Yeah. He had, well, he had three star rooms. <laughs> He eventually gave me that car when I moved to LA. I drove down. Oh, to, really? I drove down to LA nice. in that car. Yeah. Well, I drove down in a U-Haul towing that car. It was lowered. You know everything. Um, <laughs> and I, this guy pulls up, and I see my buddies like walking down the street. And I had a decision. It was like that Robert Frost bullshit right there. Hold on. From literally walking out of this fucking facility, here they come. I get driven home. Okay. Yeah. 
I remember we were close to home and my who, dad's- Wait, who picked you up? My parents did. Parents. Okay, so mom came for this. Dad dropped yeah. you off, but mom's there for the pickup. No. I was in somebody else's car, but the car overheated when we were about in, in Tacoma, like an hour from home. And we, I remember having to walk off the freeway with this guy and with gallons of water come back and like do it. And then we like got home. And I remember getting home and it was that quick. Like I walked out. My parents had called Kurt to tell him I was home because they wanted me to be with him. And the neighborhood, all the kids are hanging out in my neighborhood all the time. Like everyone's out skateboarding and stuff. And uh, I see them and see Kurt. And I was just like, hey, guys, yeah, crazy. I'll call you when I get back. And I just got in the car with Kurt. And Kurt would do this thing where just drive you around the lake like, and just talk. You know, like, listen, he'd be like, have you heard this song? You'd play a song. And we want to get a slice of pizza. You know, like it was just like a guy that was trying to keep me out of trouble. And and. And what a great job he did. I mean, that's nice. You got someone occupying your time. Yeah. And then I went to a church camp. way. Yeah. Okay. A church camp pretty soon after that, um, where I like found Jesus, you know, and like saw it and felt it and, and like wanted to believe it. And also saw this kind of thing where it's like, oh, I'm repairing in a lot of ways. And part of the program of AA is finding a higher power. And like, so this is helping me out there. Also, being around these people isn't bad. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing about churches is, is, is minus the people that suck, <laughs> it's a brilliant idea. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, but, like, like, let's just break down the actual basis of a church is it's a place where anyone in the community is welcome. Right? That's the reality of it. Supposed to be, yes. Yes. Well, that's it. Without the, idea the people of Christianity is all are welcome, yes. Without the people that have changed that, the people that right. God wouldn't even like, the people that don't represent him at all, without those people, what a brilliant place to go and feel welcome and helped. The way that Kurt helped me. Like that's that's what's good about it, you know? And I saw all that and I loved it and I wanted to get involved and I liked helping people now. And I like speaking. I remember I went back to that rehab center like a year sober and spoke to the kids that were there. That's nice. Good. And I was like speaking at high schools. And, you know, I ended up graduating and got really involved in church and just like was a leader. Like and I was, ended up in the worship band, you know, and I also like nobody looked at me like this guy's spiritually like can answer my questions. But I was kind of the show, like the showcase, like, oh, you want to see somebody whose life's turned around? Right. Nick, get up here. Tell him your story. Hold on real quick. Danny, get your tank top on, son. Flip out here. <laughs> Fire it up for Nick. Bro. Get, wait, wait about 10 minutes. Let him get to the part where he was wet in the bed, and then I wet want you to throw a flip bed. out. <laughs> we'll break for cupcakes. <laughs> We're going to break for cupcakes and backflips. <laughs> yeah. This episode of The Honeydew is brought to you by Zippix Toothpicks. Zippix brings you a totally satisfying, convenient, and flavorful way to curb cravings and relax with two milligrams and three milligram options. Remember when massive vape clouds, ashtrays, and dip spit were awesome? Now there's an easier, less messy, and more subtle way to curb cravings with Zippix Toothpicks. The best part about Zippix is that you really can use them just about anywhere. Zippix Toothpicks are long-lasting and available in six delicious flavor choices. Plus, you can stop exposing your lungs to smoke and vape fog. It's the oral gratification and amazing flavors that keep us coming back to Zippix. They only sell their toothpicks online, making it one of the most cost-effective alternatives available. Also, if you need a boost of energy, you can try their Zippix energy b12 and caffeine toothpicks go to zippixtoothpicks.com today and use code honeydew to save 10 percent off your order that's zippixtoothpicks.com promo code honeydew you must be 21 or older to order zip more smoke less with zippix toothpicks if you are like me and there's a foreign language that you regret not learning in school it's never too late to start with Babel. i started doing spanish in like eighth grade and went all the way to 11th, got a D in it, y'all. Uh, so Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can finally cross learning that new language 
off your list. I'm taking Spanish like I've told you, and I really do love it. I'm just sitting and driving in the car, listening, boom, lesson. Sit at home, sitting around, boom, lesson. It's easy, it's quick, and with Babbel, you only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson, so you can start having real-life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel lessons were created by over 150 language experts. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective, and with Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, video stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. So start your new language learning journey today with Babbel right now. You can get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash honeydew. That's babbel.com slash honeydew for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Now, let's get back to the do. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, All and right. I loved it. And then I I stuck with it. You know, I stayed sober and then I decided to move to LA because I... At what I, age are you coming here? 24. Okay. So from, you said 16, 17, you're getting yeah. out of that rehab. So eight years, you're clean and sober. Six years. Six about years. Six years, okay. yeah. And you're coming. Or no, yeah, about, yeah, about eight years. And you're coming to Los Angeles. And I come now. to Los Angeles. Okay. And it was about a year until I started smoking weed and taking pills. But I didn't drink for 12 years. Okay. 12 from being clean. From when I got sober. Okay. Um, and, you know, I started stand up. What pills are you taking? Whatever the waitress Whatever. is at the Laugh Factory would give me. <laughs> uh, <okay>. You know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it's it started going from like, you know, like, hey, you want one of these? Like to, hey, can I stop by your house and get a, and get 30 of those tomorrow at noon? You know, like immediately, I didn't realize I had an opiate addiction. Oh, okay. And I was still involved in church a bit when I moved to LA and I went to Africa on this, um, to Kenya for like this, it was like a mission trip, but we were like, you know, it, it's like, it was like this really cool thing in this area called Kibera, which is like the size of Central Park, but a million people live in it with no water, no power. Damn, a million people. Wow. It's it's something I'd never could ever imagine in my life. <laughs> Dude, I remember we were driving in there and we were like, go over this like man-made bridge and standing in the middle of the bridge is a TV crew and there's a white guy on camera. And as we drive by, it's fucking Dean Kane. Nah, -uh. doing Superman? like yeah, doing some video. <laughs> oh, and I just remember man. being like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> Kibera in Kenya? What is going on?" Anyways, three days into Kenya, I thought that I was sick. I thought I had malaria or something. But what I was doing was coming Detox, off opiates. Yeah, it was bad. It was taken huh? to the Kenyan You're hospital up and shaking and everything. Fa fainted in the shower. Damn. Um. Yeah, taken to the hospital. How many pills at your worst? Uh, how many pills a day were you taking? You know, it was like basically on, you would go on milligrams of like how, how strong the pills were. And then you're also cutting in how much of that is acetaminophen or, uh, you know, whatever that's called. Is that what it's called? Uh, yeah. Acetaminophen is the way to say it. Acetaminophen. Acetaminophen. <laughs> you're like, you know, you're doing math. Like, okay, so how much actual Tylenol am I taking and how mm -hmm. much drugs am I taking? And, you know, you're, you're constantly like doing math, but I was popping like, I don't know. There's people that do like. 40 a day. Yeah, I've heard some numbers point. that are just outrageous. I'd say I was like at 15, wow. probably off and on, but like Vicodins weren't doing it for me anymore. Percocets, if I could get them, lower tabs, what I forget, feel like one of them was called that. Anyway, so I went through detox in Kenya without knowing it and um, got home and then just, I don't know, I didn't get back into pills. I don't know what it was. I was like, just got more into marijuana. And then I, I am the first time I drank again. I mean, it's, it's in a movie, man. It's like, just, you want to know, you want to see somebody who's got a problem. This is what happens. So now I've made it in stand up enough to where I've done the tonight show. I had a comedy central half hour. Uh, I was touring regularly and I was like on the up and up getting pilots, all this stuff. I'm thinking I can handle booze, you know, like, what am I doing? Like, I'm like, I should have booze now. I mean, I just got married and I, plan out that I'm, I have a gig in Vegas and I plan out, you're going to drink. I'm going to drink at this gig. I'm going to try it out. How many years? From 12 years of not drinking. Okay. 12 full years. Yeah. Damn. Okay. So I get there and 
first thing I do is check in. It was to the Palms. Remember those shows I, I used to have at the Palms? the Palms, yeah. And uh, I go down to the pool and I order a drink. And I don't order a beer. I order a, like, what's the equivalent of like a Long Island iced tea, but it's got like absinthe and all this stuff. You know, it's like some fancy drink. Because I remember like Mitch Hedberg had a joke about absinthe. And I, you know, like I wanted to try it because of that joke. And I, you know, all these things. And I um, feel great. Go up to my room pass out on the bed, you know, just like laying on the bed watching TV and wake up to just pounding on the fucking door. And I'm like looking around, I'm like so confused. And I open the door, it's security. They're like, you're supposed to be on stage 10 minutes ago. Whoa, really? Like the opener had gone. They've been trying to call me, been trying to get into my room. That's how quickly booze affected my career and my life was just that. That was, that should have been the, okay, but that's the problem is you've done it now and it's, you know, you, there's no peeling it back. It's like if you're off sugar and then you have a gummy bear, it's like, you're going to finish that bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you're going to finish the bag, <laughs> man. I mean, bag. and then you know what? You're going to start eating bags every day. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. And then you're going to have to get off it again and that's going to suck. And, but that took me 10 years of just, okay, you know. Of what? Uh, 10 years of a gradual, immediately knowing I'm an alcoholic, immediately being able to look at myself in the mirror saying you're lying to yourself and to everybody, but continuing to do it. And slowly it overtaking every part of my life, you know, like missing flights, you know, like st st small things, you know, but it's like business. Like you don't do that. You know, you're not, yeah. you know, you can think you're an artist, but, you know, artists probably do their job and part of your job is getting on that plane. You know, except for the select few that, you know, were wild and you could see that. That's fine. But that wasn't working for me. It doesn't work for most people. And so I eventually get to, you know, there's a lot that happens in here. I mean, I'm talking like walked off a second store balcony on an Airbnb in, in Minneapolis, landed in the grass, should have died, should have broken my neck. What do you mean you walked off it? Dude, we get into this Airbnb on this tour that I'm doing. We have a day off. And so I rented this Airbnb. It's like on a lake. You can't even swim in this lake. It was like, you know, a bit right, right out of Minneapolis. Just a view. Yeah. Yeah. And it was summer and I took the master bedroom and in the ba master bedroom, there was a door. Open it and it just goes out to nothing. There, <laughs> there used to be right. something yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, And then there's signs like don't open door, <laughs> oh, right? No. But my problem was is that I didn't just like drink and pass out. I drank and then my life started. You know, like I black out and then I'm starting doing, I'm like walking around and doing shit. And I was already to the point to where like you make mistakes, like you've done this before. What, what, like what about what happened in Anchorage? Like you, you, you can't let that happen again. <laughs> I'll tell that too. But the anyway, I yeah, just like in the middle of the night, I just walked out, walked out the Fuck, thing. You could have, you definitely died from that. Yeah. Did you break any bones or anything? Or you're so shit phased, you fell out, relaxed. No, it didn't and you hurt. Were good to no, go. yeah. <laughs> Damn, but you know, you know what happened? There's this story of Towns Van Zant that he tells in this like this recorded message with his manager that they have on one of his albums, and and it's and and it's basically like saying how he fell off a balcony just because he wanted to know what it felt like to fall. You know, he wanted that feeling. And I think in my drunken state, I took that on and I wanted to do what Towns Van Zandt did or something stupid. He broke his neck when he did it. Like it He was, did. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but the, no, in Alaska, I was there with Rory and um, <laughs> Jen Kirkman and we, uh, we just got shit faced one night. I did. I did. Everyone else is probably fine. And I get back to the room and I wake up. And so this hotel was really nice in Anchorage, all tourists, you know, and most people that travel to Anchorage are older. Um, there was, we were on like the 16th floor is a VIP floor. You can't get to the floor without a key. You can't get into the door past the elevator without another key. And they had the exit stairwells, but the exit stairwell was outside. So okay. like you'd walk out of the hallway and you're outside, you walk down, walk into another hallway, walk out again. And it was like that the whole way down. Okay. You Spiraling keep, down. Yes. And the door though. So I wake up pissing <laughs> off this balcony at like 6 a.m. <laughs> wake up. You mean you come to and you're yeah. black. <laughs> I'm standing on this outdoor balcony. <laughs> this is what you're seeing yourself On the 16th do. <laughs> floor. <laughs> oh my God. I don't have my room key. I only am wearing underwear and I was wearing the underwear that I was wearing at the time was these, these American apparel briefs because you could go down that little thing up front, you know, where you mm -hmm. used to pee out of, but you could put your hand in there and it would go all the way under your butt. There was all this 
pe- storage area under there. Oh, okay. And that's where I traveled with weed. Okay. I would double. I would put weed in turkey baster bags, seal them up, double, double side sack tape them, them under your sack, put it under oh, my fuck, sack. Yeah, okay. And so I was wearing these brief under orange briefs, exactly what I was wearing that day. And I go to open the door, doors locked. I don't have anything. Fuck. So I start walking down walking down 16 <laughs> floors and there's the last door and i just i don't know what this door is opening into it's on the main floor what the door opened into was an all-you-can-eat buffet <laughs> <laughs> and it's just you all of these old door. tourists <laughs> and i just walk out and it's like <laughs> hey <laughs> and i go to the front counter and i'm like hey i'm like locked out of my room <laughs> <laughs> how many people are in there dude like, i don't even, <laughs> And they go, do you have ID? All oh, eating and looking like, what the fuck? <laughs> do you have ID? It's like, do I look like I have ID? No, no. No one like me is. <laughs> no one that's looked like this has ever had an ID on no, them, okay? No. They're either at a strip club or they're, you know. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. So they had to <laughs> they had to escort me up to my room so I could walk in and. and prove you were you. Yeah. But so like, that meant sitting in an elevator for 16 floors in my underwear with a fucking What's the care? staff. Which probably for them is like, hey, at least, oh, we don't, love at least it. it's not one of the elderly guys. Yeah, you know? they like, probably this is love it. <laughs> oh, you can eat buffet, dude. Jesus I mean, God. it was brutal. That's brutal. It was brutal. And, and so what? These are the you- types of things that are happening to me on a regular basis. And so when do you finally go the second time? Well, what I'm, puts at you this in point, there? I'm drinking over, like, I'm basically drinking a handle of vodka a day. A hand? Really? Were you? Wow. Yeah. I was buying them in fifths, but I would always have two a day and I would like have one at home, have one in my car, have one in this like hidden drawer above the cabinet in the bathroom, everywhere. I'd show up apart like a Sunday afternoon, people are out drinking in the backyard, normal people that are enjoying a beer on a Sunday. And I'm enjoying a beer too, is what they think. Except I'm sneaking to my bathroom, I'm sneaking out to my car. I'm sneaking to wherever I've got hidden vodka and taking huge drain, like five shot just drinks out of it, out of like warm fucking room temperature vodka. And then walking back out with my beer, just like, hey, I'm just like you guys, you know? And it was it was just getting horrible. And then I get to Bloomington, Indiana, and I remember the movie um, Breaking Away. Is that Tom a bicycle Cruise? movie? No, it was a bicycle movie that okay. was like 79 or 80. Daniel Stern's in it. Dennis Quaid's in it. Yes, and, Dennis Quaid. That's what just made it stick. Yep. And it's shot in Bloomington. And it's the whole movie's about the Cutters, which is like the group of like locals against the university kids because there's a big university there. And there was a swimming hole scene where they like hike to the swimming hole that's in like lime rock. And it's like this green, beautiful thing. Un- or, it doesn't look worldly, you know? And I was in Bloomington was like, I want to find that. And so then one of the guys at the comedy club was like, oh, my my buddy knows where it is. He's heard about it. So the next day, this guy takes me on a two hour hike through the woods on a private property where we're seeing like live ammunition, do not enter, (laughs) like all these signs. Fuck that. Found it, jumped off of it, just like in the movie, swam in it. It was fucking glorious, you know, leave go from there to Montreal to where the festival, Mm -hmm. you know, didn't go home. And I'm in Montreal and like, I'm doing like a week and a half of shows there, I think my own hour. And somebody sees a tick. It's right on my scalp. It's right on my hairline, right in front. There's a tick that's been in there since Bloomington. It's been about five or six days now. And they get tweezers, they pull it out. It's intact, you know, like they put it in like a little pill thing that I had and they were like, take this to the doctor when you get home and, you know, you're going to be home in three days or two days, like you should be fine, right? I get home and I'm not making good decisions. Also, I'm not going to the doctor because I smell like booze all day, every day, and they're going to check me out and I'm probably dying. And I was, I really was dying and I didn't really know how bad, you know, but like waking up with liver pains, waking up with like really? chest so you, pains. You, you would have physical and pain. And drinking. And any day, any day that I tried not to drink, it was vomiting and shaking. And then I had to drink through vomit, like, you know, drinking, trying to get booze into me so my body would even out. And I was convinced that if I didn't drink, my heart would stop. And that was what was going to happen. So like I'd wake up at two in the morning with chest pains, go find vodka, wake up at four in the morning, same thing, wake up at four, stay up till six, drinking vodka, then go to bed. Then my son's got to wake up for school. Like, it's like, you know, I was just like 
not in the world. I was living in my own world in this house and it was tearing everything down. And, um, you know, but I get this tick. I go back finally, like I'm with my writing partner, maybe a week or two after Montreal. And I go like, I have this like lesion on my arm. And I go to him. I was like, isn't this crazy? Look at this bruise. Must have been from wrestling with my son, you know, like because he like grabbed my arm or something. And he was like, huh. And then like 10 minutes later, I'm like, oh, my God, did I tell you about Bloomington? I got with a tick. You know, I'm telling him the story. I'm also drunk right now. You know, I'm always drunk. I drink all day. And I don't know this. He's Googling ticks, Lyme disease. And what's the promo poster photo of what it looks like is a, a bullseye lesion. Is that right? Yeah. And um, he's like, you need to go. to." We stopped writing that's right all, then. That's all I ever heard of ki- as a kid. I know, as I'm saying to you before uh, outside, like, I don't know what. Lyme disease is what it does to your body, but everything was as soon as you get in from the woods, everybody check for ticks. Yeah, because you can get Lyme disease. Yeah, we're like, that doesn't sound good. We don't want that, so let's check for ticks. I mean, it's one of those. I've seen them on dogs that they get. Oh my god, looks like a bubble. Like, oh, it's just sucking on that fucking dog for like weeks and shit. Like (laughs) Jesus Christ, it's so scary. And also, there's a good section of people that don't think it's real. You know, really? And, and there's also, Why would you not think so? You know, because it's uh, well, like, whatever. it's hard Somebody to detect idiot. what's actually happening to you, mm-hmm. you know, like what it's actually doing in your body. And some people have chronic Lyme's or they have all these things, you know, if you find it in, early enough, like, like I did, I got on these antibiotics and I got rid of it, but I didn't get rid of it I, until I got sober. I was on the antibiotics for, I think, like four months, for, to be honest, or something. And they're hardcore. And when you're drinking, they just cancel out antibiotics so altogether. What, what does so Lyme, I was having oh, like, right? I was waking up feeling fine, right? Go out to my car, besides like the hangover and the, all the other shit going on in my life. Sit down and all of a sudden I can't sit. My tailbone hurts so bad. Like I can't sit. I never felt that in my life. Go in, have to get in bed, wake up, tailbone feels fine. Now I can't move my arm. Like it's just going between joints, you know, and like – the, the, the feeling of exhaustion, I mean, I was just sleeping so much and drinking in, when I wasn't sleeping, you know, like hidden in the closet in the guest room where I was now living at my house with like Lyme's disease, like where the AC was blowing. And I'm just like, you know, my friend dies of alcohol. Really? Yeah. This amazing singer, songwriter, producer that lived in Oregon. He, um, we talked a week before he died and we both realized we were drinking the same amount. He, he like FaceTime. I remember he FaceTime called me, which nobody had ever <laughs> doing that. And like, like it's so weird. Why would Richard do that? And we're talking and, you know, it's like, I got to stop. I got to get help. I'm like, me too, man. You know, like whatever. And then a week later, he goes, he gets taken to the hospital. Day later, taken to hospice. Three days later, dead. That quick. Organ failure. Gone like whatever. Like he turned yellow. It happened to a, a kid I went to high school with. His older brother, I saw a post and I reached out and just said, hey, man, I'm so sorry. What the fuck happened? Because his young, his brother who passed was my grade. And um, he said the same thing. He said he never stopped drinking like we were in high school and you know college. And he just kept drinking and smoking. And he said one day he woke up, his eyes were yellow. He went right to the doctor and they're like, we're, it's too late for you. And within like, I don't, I don't know, a few weeks he was gone. It's, Yeah. So is that, so that your wake up call no. then? No, no, it eventually was, but that took me down. I went up, I went up and did a memorial show in, in Portland for him with uh, a whole bunch of other musicians that he'd worked with. I mean, the Shins, and I hosted the whole thing at this cool theater. I forget which one it was at in Portland. Afterwards, everyone is going out to a bar, and I remember like this was my this was my rough trip in Portland, where I ended up having to stay an extra couple of days because I was so sick. But I remember getting to the bar and they let everyone in. And I barely remember this, but I've been told about it from a lot of people. That I came up to the door and the guy just said, no. Really? And I was like, what? Why? And he's like, something's not right about you. You can't come in. (laughs) Like everyone's inside. I'm like, you guys. And they're like, no, let him in. He's fine. He's fine. And the guy's like, I'm sorry. I can't let somebody like that in here. Like whatever state I was in, you know, we're coming straight from the memorial service. It was like. Oh God, it was a bad night. And I continued to go and go and go. And then finally, I mean, I I go to the doctor and the Lyme stuff is being figured out and they got my blood test back. And this is a, a doctor in Malibu. At like my appointment was like at 10 in the morning. 
And um, I've been drinking on the way there, you know, and, and I get in there and I sit down and he's like looking at my papers and he's like, so you didn't tell me you were a drinker. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, your enzymes. He goes, uh, you've got 360 enzymes in your liver. And again, I'm, I'm, my, 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 I don't know. My numbers might be, uh, I was drunk. I don't remember all of it, but. What's that mean? I don't know. But I said, what does that mean? And he says, you're supposed to have six. <laughs> Wait, did you say six? And yeah. You have 360? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. It was like, he's like, you need to stop drinking. He's like, I can help you. I can give you medications to stop drinking. And he like writes out this big list of things that he's going to start giving me to help me stop drinking. But I leave there and grab a bottle of vodka, drive up the pass in you know Malibu, like mm-hmm. over by Pepperdine University. And I'm driving and they have these like little, as you're going through the canyons there, like a pull off, you can like pull off for a view site or something. And it always says no parking. I pulled off on one of those and got out of my truck with uh, vodka in my hand. And I was drinking like a quarter of it in, just while I'm driving, you know, that's how sick I was. I was driving drunk. It, it was, it's, a sh- I'm, you know, I'm ashamed of the risk that I put other people through my problem. And I just started kind of walking down the canyon off the side of the road there thinking I'm not coming back. Really? And I got, and I had like a whole bunch of pills and Xanax and all this stuff. And halfway down, something hits me like, oh, if you decide not to die, you might get a parking ticket. (laughs) In my mind, like that was like, okay, yeah, you can't do this then. Right. You're not ready. So I went up, got in my car, drove through the canyon so drunk. It was like, I don't know. I mean, know. that's in, that's that's so dangerous. It is beyond dangerous. I pull over and I call Even my- Even if you know there's no traffic on that road the whole way to do that yourself, those canyon roads are wildly fucking uh, dangerous and curvy. Yeah. It's, yeah. I call my best friend, riding partner, and I call my manager and I just say- my hands are up, man. Somebody needs to come pick me up and save my life. Take me somewhere. And my buddy, Kevin, like drives out, picks me up. My manager got me into a rehab. You know, managers can do stuff like that. <laughs> like got me to rehab that day. Like they weren't taking people anymore. And it, it was this really cool, like Malibu rehab, you know. And I came in and they took a breathalyzer. 0.38. Jesus Christ. From... Right from the spot to there? Just, yeah, I finished that whole bottle of vodka. 0.38. How are you even upright? It, I was talking. How? They were fat, They were blown away at my casual demeanor yeah. and conversation. And you were holding conversation? Yes. I was, sat, I was that sick, man. I was drinking so much booze. But also the pills, too. Like, look, I'm fortunate. I'm allergic to opiates. They mm-hmm. make me throw up. They make me break out, itch, hives, the whole nine. It sucks because I also can't take them for pain. But that alone, I mean, I, I, I know how I feel on those fucking things. And then to put a bottle of vodka on top of it and you're having conversation. Yeah, 0.08. Maybe it was 0.32. Either know. way, 0.08 yeah. your 0.08 legal is your legal limit. limit. Yeah. And I was well above it, Whew. over two above it. And um, yeah, they, they they checked me in. I woke up and it just, you know, the next two days were an absolute blur of delusions. Um, I was seeing things. They were trying to keep me alive. Because, you know, in rehab, really what they're trying to do is help you detox comfortably and then help you get better, give you classes, teach you about your addiction, teach you about emotional things that you're doing, you know, all this stuff. Two days in, I'm full on having conversations out at a back table with nobody around me. And the rehab's monitoring me. They're all watching it. Everyone there is like, this is a unique case. This guy, you know, and they're all just kind of like letting me, and I got convinced that they were after me, like that they were gonna check me into a mental institute because they thought I was mentally breaking down. Did you realize you were having conversations out back by yourself or was that thing no. you saw on video later? Or they, they told never, you? They never showed they me. They tell you. Yeah. They, um, I was entertained. They found me naked out in the backyard finally um, at like 4 a.m. or 2 a.m. And um, I was dying. They rushed me to the hospital, Los Robles Hospital or something. And um, I don't know. I woke up a week later. A week? They, they rushed me in the hospital and I kind of remember this moment where I'm in a movie and I'm getting wheeled down a hallway and I'm seeing the ceiling. And some guy, and I'm like, try to move my arms. And some guy goes, Nick, 
we're trying to save your life. You're strapped down because you've been combative. You hear, you hear this. That's what, all I remember hearing. And whatever, <sighs> they couldn't get an IV into me, right? Just, they were trying so hard, that combative, and also like just dehydrated and all the things that I was. And I remember the nurse from the rehab saying, I've never seen someone be stabbed. Like they were stabbing you to get that into your arm, to get you to like knock out because you were being so like kicking and punching. You were buck naked, you know, just like in this hospital. <laughs> Jeez. And I remember waking up and it's like, it's funny, like, I called Al Madrigal somehow. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't know how, where I got his number. I don't know. But Al, I'd love to actually talk to Al about that now and be like, what was that conversation like? Because I can't remember anything. But I remember it was like I was canceling a show or something. I don't know. Anyway, I'm in the hospital. They get me out. And I was just done, man. I wanted to live. I just, I just realized like I can't do this anymore. I wasn't one of the people there that's like, I don't want to be in rehab. I was like, I want to be better. My life is done. It was just finished. I now have a second shot. I've torn everything down. I've, I'm, you know, like living in a house that I can't afford anymore. I'm not able to work. You know, I'm doing all of these things and. Yeah, I mean, our job, well, hell, any job, without your health, you, you, you're not working. Yeah. No. Yeah, so I stayed. Especially something like this. Uh-uh. I mean, it was, yeah, 60 days I stayed in there. 60. In the middle of it, it burnt down. <laughs> <laughs> Malibu fires. It was crazy. <laughs> I, woke up at, I woke up at 8 in the morning, and it was like, that's weird. Usually like, somebody, like, comes by and knocks on the window and wakes me up. And I go out, and I'm in the kitchen. They have this fancy kitchen where they're serving, you know, it's a nice rehab. And uh, I'm like making my lemon juice that I was making every morning and people are like scrambling and there was smoke the night before, you know, and I'm like, hey, so what's the deal with the fire? And they go, we have to be out of here in a half hour. Like they were evacuating the place and somebody just forgot to wake me up Nah, because I was in the furthest room away from everything. And so I run and scramble, get all my shit. I was in the last car out of there with the nurse and a dog that they just found a dog. And it burnt down an hour later. Damn. And we ended up at some like Airbnb in Oxnard where we, we, were, we were like <laughs> stayed there for a few days and found another rehab center to take over and move into. It was wild. And what happens when you get out? I go home. And that was how many years ago now? Uh, four in October. Good for you. You've been sober the whole time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. And – uh my life was just torn down. You know, I get home, divorce, move out, move in with friends, living in a friend's like downstairs basement. Then the pandemic hits. Oh, I'm living in a studio. You know, like I basically went down to the ground and I'm now getting out. Good for you, dude. You know, and everything is, you know, like it's, it's better. It's good. It's not like, I'm not like this guy that's like, I'm fixed and I'm done. Like, I know I'm not. And I go looking for help all the time because that's the only, you know, I, I've learned that, you know, you're, seek, you're only, what is the, um, you're only as something as your secrets. You're only as sick as your secrets. Mm, I've never heard that before. You're, you're only, only as sick, sick as, as your secrets. secrets. And, and no matter how heavy the phone is, it's actually just a button. You know, like anytime you need to just talk to somebody, it's so simple and it's so hard at the same time, you know, but understanding that it actually is simple and that you're creating the difficulty. And that's a lot of people don't make it through that. A lot of people don't get past that part. And I'm lucky that I've been able to do enough of the work to where I am. I'm setting, I set boundaries in my life. I, I'm, I'm doing things where I know that I'm not putting myself in positions to go to old behaviors. Right. You know, like right. whether it comes to being coming attached to a woman or like in a relationship, like all these things, like if I can't be, you know, if I can't just be me and be happy, like if I need somebody to bring that, then, it, then I'm off. There's something that's wrong, that's you know, right. and I'll get there and then I'll have to figure it and I'll back up and do it again. And it's a, you know, it's this huge process, but. How you know, do you, um, I want to ask you this. How do you deal with i mean our business is a lot of weed especially pills alcohol mm -hmm. how do you deal every everywhere you work has alcohol i'm not tempted good right like i don't right now and i haven't i i mean it was so bad that i i know that i'll lose everything and i can't lose everything again 
it, there's no, might not be no coming back from that one. I agree. Most likely not. Most people don't make it back out. I'm lucky I made it back out of that relapse. Your blood work and everything's good oh, now and everything. Yeah, you I mean, go get you know, out. a year later, a lot of those things fix themselves. If you're right? young yeah. and you didn't go too far. Mm -hmm. um, but your brain, I mean, that takes years. The chemical imbalance there is years. And I remember, you know, when I got out, I was seeing somebody and, and she kind of ended it because there's this rule, like you can't be with somebody in your first year of sobriety, they, they say. Oh, no relationship at all. Okay. Yeah, they just, you know, it's like best. There's nowhere in a book that says that. It's just like, hey, realistically, you shouldn't be. Work on yourself for yeah, a year here. Yeah, yeah. That's and good so advice. this woman was like very strong and, and, and solid in that. And I, it just, again, like took me down to a place. And I remember I, I was trying to call her. I was trying to get a hold of her. And finally we talked and I was driving on Hyperion, I remember. And I was just crying. I was out of sorts. And she goes, Nick, the way that you're talking right now, I've heard people talk like this and commit suicide that day. The way that you're talking. You need to call your doctor and you need to get on medication. And they'd offered me medication and rehab. I'm like, I don't need, I'm not, I don't need that stuff. But the thing is, is you've been drinking, you're, all the levels of the things that are going into your brain to make you feel things are off, off and depleted. Yeah. They're gone. Like my body can't create serotonin. My body can't make these things that I need to be level, to like be a human. I've ruined that, you know? And she said, like, like right now, who are you going to call? What's the name? And I was like, oh, I'll just call the doctor from rehab, I guess. And I just did. And the next day I started medication, you know, and it saved my life. Yeah. And good. You know, I know I'm from the it's funny. I, I've talked about this because I take my medication as well. And I didn't want to. I felt like I had no problem with therapy where a lot of guys were like, fuck that shit. I have no problem with the therapy, opening up, talking, mm -hmm. meditation, journaling, self-help, self-help. But medication to me seemed like a, a crutch or a cheat code. Like a lot of the way I feel like I felt about medication the way a lot of people feel about therapy. You know, I'm like, what's the matter with that? And then other people are like, yo, and it, yeah, it works. It's, it fucking works. And, and you don't always find the right one either. Like everyone's body is different. You know, oh, yeah. I can't tell you how many different fucking blood pressure medications I took or whatever until I found whatever is minimal to my. It, it's yeah. funny though. There's so many people that it's not funny. It's realistic and it makes sense to be honest. But a lot of people are like, oh, I can't take that anymore because it makes it so I can't orgasm or it makes it so I can't like, I can't like get hard like whatever these like things that they want their body to be able to do this medication is affecting that in a way and they're not willing to make that sacrifice and and because of that they're going to now be living with this thing that's horrible right you know and maybe that means that there's another medication that doesn't exactly. do that you can keep going and trying and doing that's whatever right. but like you know the side effects if they're not life-threatening are so great because I don't, I also don't believe that medication's forever. It's, you know, like my body needed it. My brain needed it. And then there's a part of me that's like, you know, over the pandemic, I was like, I want to start getting off this. And they were like, we, we, we want you to, too. Let's wait for the pandemic to be over. It's pretty dark right now. You know, like let's, yeah. you shouldn't be trying to do this right they're, now. By the way, they're delivering alcohol to your house now. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, like, fuck, oh, it's not the time to do it. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I, I mean, when I found out about DoorDash delivering booze before, oh. before there was like another beverage app or whatever, before the pandemic, that's when a lot of my drinks were getting delivered like that. And I was like secretly in the middle of the night, like r rushing out and grabbing a bottle of anyways. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, um, you know, I'm not like an advocate for, I'm not, I'm not like speaking for a company. I just know that what my friend told me that day changed my life, that saved my life. Because yeah. it, it's, you know, it's, I realize that I'm not above the darkest, worst stuff, which is suicide, which is, you know, thinking that I don't matter, thinking that other people are better off if they don't have to deal with me in their day, you know? But that's the thing is that those are all my thoughts. Right. And you know what those people are also having? Their own, their own thoughts. thoughts. And to think that everyone is that concerned about me and that I'm affecting other people's lives that much is a sickness that came from my alcohol, you know? 
And now I'm like getting over it and realizing like, oh. I don't need to believe the lie that alcohol has been telling me all this time. And yeah, and you know what? Yeah, you've done some shit that some people probably are never going to really want to be close to you again because of, even if you've changed. And that's not their fault. It's your fault. There's nothing you need to fix it. And there's nothing you can do to like, that's going to dwell. Like why dwell on what other people are thinking about you? It's just literally none of my business, Mm -hmm. which is the hardest thing. It really is. It's none of our business. Somebody blocked me on, somebody unfollowed me on Instagram, a friend. I found it so weird. He stopped responding to my texts and he unfollowed me. This is like past so bright. I'm like sober at this point. And I was in Canada shooting something. And I remember like, I still followed him. So I'd like see his stuff. And every time I saw him post, it like made me think, what's wrong with me? Why didn't this person, you know, like what, or like nobody likes me. Nobody likes me. This guy doesn't like me, you know? And then one day I was in this thing and I was like, who fucking cares what this fucking guy thinks of you? It does not matter. And it's not about you. Cause I know that I didn't do anything that to deserve that really, I hadn't. And so, I just decided to be okay with it. And then I run into this guy six months later and he was a sober guy and he's drinking. And I see exactly why it all happened. He's going through his own shit just like everybody else. It has nothing to do with me. Nothing. Him unfollowing me was a fallout because I'm somebody he can tell that is not going to be okay with him doing that. Yeah, so he's getting away from you. Yeah. And every time he saw something I posted, he remembered, oh, Nick fixed his life and now mine's not fixed. I can't fix whatever maybe also he just hates me who cares you know who cares it's not my business and if i make it my business you know it's like it's so funny like how you can like feel out if you've done something dumb like you talk to somebody else like oh you talked to so and so lately yeah i feel like he's not talking to me has he said anything like you know all these things like you're trying to do research to find out you're wasting so much time then you find out like someone in their family died and they're going through a fucking divorce and they're going through you're like oh shit yeah (laughs) yeah oh shit my bad yeah and it's these attachments you know it's like Mm -hmm. this insecure this anxious attachment that you have to people where if they're off it throws you off. Whereas you can't just be like securely attached. And if they're having their own thing, be like, hey, have your thing. I'm I'll here. be here. I'm here. That's right. Yeah, man. I'm and here. I'm not going to judge it. I'm That's not going to make it about me, which is the hardest thing to do all the time. <laughs> you know, constantly trying to make things about myself, like the weather. <laughs> like, you know, like, 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 like if I really follow the thoughts, Everything's about me, a traffic jam, all of it. It's to keep me from what I need to do. It's, oh, I could have done this, but now I can't because of this fucking weather. So obviously. (laughs) All right. So everything we've (laughs) talked about, I mentioned before um, advice you would give to your 16 year old self. Now, everything we so rehab was first at 17. What advice is a pretty pivotal age for you? What advice would you give yourself? That it not, none of it lasts. All of the things that you're in don't last. You mean good and bad? Yeah. They don't. I mean, but specifically the insecurities, the um, the level of hierarchy in whatever your clique is or your school or whatever, none of that lasts. We all turn 18, we move on. We come back, we see other people, people that were mean to us are now nice. A guy that we thought sucked and was like better than us at everything is now working in real estate and doing pretty well for himself, but probably hates it. You know, who knows? You know, like no one, it just doesn't last. And stop thinking that what you do that day lasts forever in these people's minds. And really, the only person that you should be trying to impress is the 42 year old version of yourself. You know, because the things that I did right when I look back, I'm like, Wow, I can't believe I had that strength. You know? So funny. I just said this to a friend of mine the other day. I was like, God, if I could just go back as like a a ghost and hover over my 17-year-old self and watch myself for a little bit, I'd be like, what a fucking asshole. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you said that out loud. But what you if you did could... those things? <laughs> yeah, but but yes, taking that 16-year-old kid and going, look, I know you're no parents and you're at your lowest, but I promise you. 
in yeah. 35 years. I'm like, what? I got to get how much longer yeah. I got to do this shit for? Dude, I remember at 15, a pivotal moment. <laughs> like, how long? <laughs> so for, I'm going to be like that for this long? Okay. Yeah. And I'm, okay, great, great. I'm not going to get any taller. Okay. You know, no. but, <laughs> but I remember when I was 15, a teacher did this exercise one day where he was like, let's just break down like, how do you want to live when you're 35? You know, you want to be in a house? You want to be in an apartment? Do you want to live in a city? Do you want to live in a suburb? Do you want to drive a sports car? Do you want to drive this car? Do you want to have kids? Do you want to have this? And you go through it and you like put all that together. And then there was an equation that calculated how much money you needed to make a year to support the life that you thought you wanted to have when you're 35. And then they take that number and they show you the careers that can earn that. And it's a real awakening moment. I I'm obviously never forgot about it, you know, where I was just like, oh, wow. And I lowered, I immediately lowered what I wanted my life to be. I was like, I don't need a house. <laughs> right away, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm like, ah, like fuck like, that. I'm never going to make that much money. Like, how am I going to do that? I don't need a car, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice, though. It doesn't last. It doesn't. It doesn't. No. Dude, thank you for coming on for real. Uh, this was, I, I learned a lot more about you. I didn't know. I'm glad you're healthy. Good for you yeah, for getting thank yourself you. uh, straight. Um, and and uh, would you be interested in going into a backflip program with me? I would love to, dude. That would be great. A backflip program for adults. I remember adults. seeing comedians that would do I think Tripoli might have used to do a backflip back Tripoli? in the day. And I would always think, man, like at some point, you're not going to be able to pull that off. You know? I wonder. I mean, I don't know him as ever doing a backflip. I don't know been. if it was him. It might have been him and I talking about this guy that always did a flip. And I'm like, There was hey. a couple guys that do it. Mm-hmm. There's like a guy now that does it on stage, I think. Still? Or oh, as a young guy, probably. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, but it's worth it. You know, it's yeah. like, I don't know. Would you do it? Yeah, fuck it. Yeah. Not in stand up. I wouldn't. I would, you know, where I would do it. You don't meet know, greets, man. Bro. You I'd don't it know. <laughs> you don't know. Uh, plug and uh, promote everything again. Oh, yeah. Please. October 8th, Chicago, the Den Theater. Um, and just, you know, I don't know. Find me on Instagram. All right. Um, as always, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. We will talk to y'all next week. <laughs> <laughs>